let's move on. Um, and we're still in, very much in the introductory phase. All right? So there's, there's still a lot of description, there's still a lot of definition coming out. And there's a bit of description in the next couple <coughs> of slides and then we'll get to some definitions again uh, and we'll bat it around a little bit before we get on to uh, what we mean by interatomic bonding and so on. Uh, so this isn't going to surprise you greatly. This is a very naive picture of the structure of an atom. Most of you will have seen something like this before. Uh, it's a dense nucleus in the middle, which is where the neutrons and protons are. That is where all the mass is, to a very good approximation. Um, and surrounding that nucleus, there are electrons. Now, in the earliest nuclear models of the atom, the electrons were assumed to be behaving a little bit like planets in the solar system. They were in circular orbits. And we'll do some calculation based on that model later in the module. It right, actually comes out with some remarkably <coughs> destructive results, even though you know, there's, there's quite a lot of weakness to this model. But it does actually get us a fairly long way forward bef before we need to move away from it. Um, so the chemical properties of an element are controlled by the outermost electrons. Right? Those are the electrons that, if I can use this word, uh, we'll see the other atoms, sense the other <coughs> atoms around them. I right? don't read too much into those words. But because they're the outermost electrons, they are the ones that are necessarily involved in chemistry. Right? So all of chemistry, uh, if I can put it crudely <coughs> like this without wishing to sound pejorative at all, is determined by these outermost electrons. The colour of materials and what colours of light they absorb or reflect or whatever are controlled by these outermost electrons. So they're really important, right? All of electrical conduction <coughs> in metals, for instance, is controlled by the outermost electrons. If you want to produce X-rays, however, we're talking about electrons now much closer to the nucleus. Right? And we'll, we'll, we'll plough through all of this in some, some detail at some point or other. And then, as I say, we get into the nucleus, and that's where the protons and neutrons are, uh, and they have the mass. Now, again, to give you some ballpark figures for sizes, right, we have already determined that that is something times 10 to the minus 10 of a metre. Yeah? Spacing between atoms... The diameter of an atom, however you want to mix it up, is going to be something times 10 to the minus 10 of a metre. From one end of the periodic table to the other, that is true. What about the size of the nucleus? Just to illustrate how naive this diagram is. Sorry? Yeah, that's more like it. It has a diameter of about 10 to the minus 15 of a metre. Five <coughs> orders of magnitude, a factor of 100,000 times smaller than the size of the atom itself, if we measure in terms of these electron orbits. All right, so this is a highly dense, very, very small um, thing in the middle, all right, which contains protons which are positively charged and neutrons which have no charge. So this is a small, massive, positive charge. Right? In that crude sense, most of an atom is nothing. Right? This is 100,000 times bigger than this. Okay, so that's our naive view uh, of the atom. And it's, you know, it's fine as far as it goes. Um, when you get into quantum mechanics, and you will begin this next year and then develop it very, very much in stage two, um, you're going to be thinking not about electrons in orbits, but about electrons in orbitals. So you'll be working in terms of the probability of an electron being in a particular part of space as opposed to some other part of space. But it's all probability. 
So the electrons closest to the nucleus, for instance, are in things called S orbitals, spherical orbitals. Um, and all this diagram is telling us is that there is a high probability that our electron will be uh, in uh, actually in a shell of some thickness that's defined, you know, in visually in that diagram up there. Right? But it is only a probability. The probability is not zero that the electron at some moment of time will be inside the nucleus or the other side of the universe. Probability is really, really small. But mathematically, it's not zero. But it is most probable that the electron will be found in that spherical shell. If we come out from the nucleus, we get things that are slightly more complicated. We now get these sort of dumbbell-shaped p orbitals, and they're in, in the three orthogonal directions, x, y, and z uh, directions, if you like. So if you stick them all together, we get this shape uh, out here. But again, this is all probability. Our p orbital electrons will be sitting in shells that are defined now by these dumbbell shapes, uh, most probably, but you know, not necessarily. But as I say, this is, this is just showing you what's coming rather than anything that we're going to be able to talk about very much um, this term. The one thing I guess you do need to know is that as we move out from the nucleus, these different shells that we're talking about, or orbits, whatever the word is that we're going to use, and we'll use both, uh, have a maximum number of electrons that they can hold. All right, so for that innermost, in fact, for all the s orbitals, uh, <coughs> that number is going to be two. For p, it's six. So each of these dumbbells holds two, but there are three of the dumbbells stacked together, basically. All right, and then we go on as we go through the periodic table. The number goes up, and then um, you know we get s one, and then we get s two and p two, and then we get s three and p three and you know, so on and so forth, until we work out through the periodic table. The details of this you don't need to know. I'm just trying to give you an overall picture of how these things are um, described and set up. Um, there are images. Uh, this was taken from, uh, oh, it says what it's taken from, a journal called Physical Review. Uh, in 2009, this was the first published image um, of... Uh, an S orbital and one of the P orbitals, right, from something called a field effect electron microscope. If you want to go and look it up, that journal is available online very easily. You can go and find the paper. Right, but this is, you know, this is inferred from electron microscopy data. <coughs> this is, you know, don't imagine <coughs> this as a photograph of an S or a P orbital, it's not. Uh, very much it's not. But this is what is, is modelled out of the data that came from this particular form of electron microscope. Okay, so um, that's our basic model of the atom. Now we have to think a little bit more sophisticated way about uh, the nucleus. And we've already introduced and used this in, in one way or another. Uh, but I want formally to describe and define what I mean now by, by an isotope. Right, so an isotope is a form of an element, so one element in the periodic table we're talking about uh, in each case, which simply has a different number of neutrons to another form of that same element. Right? It remains the same element because, remember what we said last week, it's the number of protons that defines which element it is. Which is reasonable. All right? Protons are the positively charged bit in the, in the nucleus. In a, you know, <coughs> ordinary, undisturbed atom, as it were, there will be the same number of negatively charged electrons around because the charges will balance out, we'll have a neutral atom. And it's those electrons, remember, that are determining the chemical properties, what this element behaves like. So all of those things are the same. 
it still behaves like, to all intents and purposes, uh, and to all purposes in chemistry, with one or two exceptions, it behaves exactly like uh, any other isotope of that element. Because all the things that are involved in chemical reactions and so on and so forth are the same. But it's different because it's got a different number of neutrons. So the mass of this element, the isotope of this element, has changed depending on how many neutrons it's got. The mass number, remember, is just a count of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if we change the number of neutrons, whilst we have not changed the chemical properties of our element, what it looks like and behaves like, we have nevertheless changed its mass number by one if we add one neutron. Yeah? So if we look at one end of the periodic table, for instance, at um, hydrogen, there are three uh, isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, there's the most common one that we know and love, uh, which has just <coughs> the proton in the nucleus. It has a mass number of one. Okay? But now this is why we had to move from mass to numbers of protons to order our periodic table. Can't just use hydrogen as our ruler for everything else because it was later discovered that there is a stable isotope of hydrogen <coughs> that actually has a proton and a neutron in the nucleus. In other words, it has a mass number of two. Still only has one proton, still only has one electron, behaves like any other form of hydrogen, chemically, but has double the mass of Okay? Um, and then there's a third form where there are two neutrons now in the nucleus. Now this happens to be unstable. This is a radioactive uh, form of hydrogen. This is actually something that's produced um, in the cooling water circuits of nuclear reactors. Right? Which is why leaks in cooling systems of nuclear reactors are not good news because you're releasing radioactive tritium. You know, if we're talking about water, this is something that vaporizes and disperses <coughs> in the air. We now have a gas of radioactive containing material that drifts around the place. Not good news. Um, so it's why cooling systems have to be really, really, really carefully uh, defined. But these are the three relatively common, this one being the <coughs> dominant, but relatively common isotopes of hydrogen. They are all hydrogen, but they have mass number of one, two, or three, depending on how many neutrons uh, are in the nucleus. All right, now that's true for a great many elements in the periodic table and we'll, we'll come back to that towards the end of the module when we think about radioactivity because most of the isotopes in existence are radioactive um, but we'll leave that for now so our next little subtopic is, is ions All right, so we've talked about changing the nucleus that's what gives us isotopes now we're going to talk about ions and ions are formed when we either add or take away one or more electrons from our atom of our element. Okay? So if we take an electron away, if we take away a negative charge from an atom, then by definition we're left now with more protons than electrons, so we're going to have a positive ion left. If, however, we add an electron to the atom, we've added a negative charge, we have more electrons than protons now, we've got a negative ion. And it doesn't have to be one electron, it can be two, three, even four for some uh, elements. Right? You can strip more electrons away than that if you want to but actually you have to do it by things, you know, it certainly doesn't happen in common or garden chemical reactions. But one, two, three, and four will. It doesn't take huge amounts of energy for some elements to change the number of electrons by that amount. Um, and, you know, the formation of ions is really important. Actually, it's really important 
across the board, but certainly when it comes to um, materials like salt, for instance, um, <coughs> sodium and chlorine stick together to form salt because one of them loses an electron, the sodium, and the other, chlorine, picks that electron up. So now we have one thing that has a net positive charge and another that has a net negative charge. Common or garden electrostatics will stick them together. Positive and negative <coughs> charges will attract each other. Okay, so we end up with common <coughs> salt. So it won't surprise you to know that ions are absolutely vital to keeping us alive. Most of our aqueous based physiological reactions depend on ionic processes. There's electrons being swapped around in your bodies all the time and you rely on it. Right? The haemoglobin works in your bloodstream because we can change iron from being 2 plus to 3 plus and back again. And that's actually hugely important in terms of grabbing and releasing oxygen. Right, so these things are genuinely really, really important. How are we doing? Uh, right, no, I'll stop. Uh, and we'll, we'll start looking then at forms of matter tomorrow <coughs> and then we'll move into uh, chemical bonding um, and look at that in some detail. Okay, so I'll see you guys tomorrow.